Let's talk about offenses. Jesus said, offenses will come. They're inevitable. They're going to happen. It's what happens next that's the point. Here it is. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. So, Lord, as we look at your word, we pray we may hear, we may receive, and we may respond. In Jesus' name. It is impossible that no offences should come, but woe to him who, through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Wow. Here's the thing. The level of our offendability reveals the level of our maturity. Ken Key said, more suffering comes into the world by people taking offense than by people intending to give offense. The offended ones feel the need to offend back those who they think have offended them, creating defensiveness on the part of the presumed offenders, which often becomes a new offensive. Ad infinitum, it goes on. Hurt people hurt people. You say something to me and my immediate response is somehow my fists come up inside my head and I want to retaliate. And it requires grace not to. And the key word here is the word scandaler. It's not interesting. That's the word for offences. And it's where we get the English term scandal. Scandal. Woe to the person through whom these scandals come. So the meaning of scandaler is not just public scandals that make the newspaper headlines, that sort of thing. It might include that. But the scandaler here could be anything that causes someone else, particularly someone, well, less mature, weaker <laughs> than you, to stumble and fall in their Christian faith. And in some versions, they use the phrase stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks. It's a strange phrase, isn't it? So if you're intentionally preventing someone else's progress stumbling blocks or offenses jesus is concerned that we do nothing that cause someone else to stumble and fall and perhaps even lose their their way forward lose their ability to follow to make their way in life our words our actions our example these have consequences Everything we do has a ripple effect. And so we're called to be attentive, to watch that, to be mindful about what we're doing, what we're saying. The psalmist says again and again, set a guard on my lips, Lord, that I might not sin against thee. And of course, that's not a me-God relationship. It's, it's a humanity relationship. It's a community thing. And Jesus says, brings this particularly into the area of forgiveness. If, if he sins against you seven times, if he says sorry, forgive him. It's not, it's not a numerical point, right? You don't wait till number eight and then punch him. It's relationship. It's community. The closer that you live in relationship with other people, the more occasions will arise when we hurt each other, even sin against each other. And consequently, there's a greater need for what someone wonderfully called living forgivingly, living forgivingly. I remember reading this, this kind of action novel one time, and it used the phrase, get your retaliation in early. <laughs> well, <laughs> preemptive retaliation. But we need to 
be ready to get our forgiveness in, get our forgiveness in early, to live lightly, to live in grace. Okay, community means grace. And Jesus told that wonderful story of debts. And he said, if you've been forgiven a great debt, then you should live in the generosity of the grace that you've received. If you've been forgiven something big, then forgive the people around you, the small things that they've done to you. Grace received equals grace lived. And here's Bonhoeffer, who wrote an incredible book, little book. Get it. Pick it, pick it out. It's wonderful. It's called Living Together or Life Together. Life Together. Here we go. A Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. Wow. His face, that hitherto may have been strange and intolerable to me, is transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died, the face of a forgiven sinner. That's really clever, because what Bonhoeffer is doing is he's bringing your offense, that the thing that you've received, into the relationship you have with Christ and into the way Christ is towards you and me and us that this is part of a circle of forgiveness now the only alternative to, to receiving what Bonhoeffer said is to withdraw retire hurt leave the church because they've got something wrong again keep your distance don't let other people get too close but that's not really ever an answer is it no Christ has placed us in community, and that community is called the church. And we're to share our life together. And the Greek word is koinonia, fellowship, sharing, sharing, the koinonia. That's what we do when we celebrate communion. We are, we, we are enacting in symbolic form something that is intrinsically human. We all belong together just have a quote here oh, here it is there's a kind of listen this is Bonhoeffer again there's a kind of listening with half an ear that presumes already to know what the other person has to say it is an impatient in inattentive listening that despises the brother and is only waiting for a chance to speak and thus get rid of the other person this is no fulfillment of our obligation and it is certain that here too our attitude towards our brother only affects our relationship to God. It's little wonder that we're no longer capable of the greatest service of listening that God has committed to us, that of hearing our brother's confession, if we refuse to give ear to our brother on lesser subjects. Amen. Do you do that? Do I do that, Lord? Like listening, just waiting for the gap in the conversation so I can cap the person who's speaking and tell my own better story joke point secular education today is aware that often a person can be helped merely by having someone who will listen to him seriously and upon this insight it has constructed its own soul therapy which has attracted great numbers of people including christians but christians have forgotten that the ministry of listening has been committed to them by him who is himself the great listener and whose work they should share we should listen with the ears of God, that we may speak the words of God. Bonov is talking about confession, but he's not talking in a kind of clinical way that is sometimes the way of the Roman Catholic Church of, of you know, a, a certain ordained individual listening. He's talking about community, sharing and learning to share love and learning to share vulnerability. That's when he uses the word confession. That's where he's, that's where he's heading. Christian community is like the Christian's sanctification. It is a gift of God, which we cannot claim. 
Only God knows the real state of our fellowship, of our sanctification. What may appear weak and trifling to us may be great and glorious to God. Just as the Christian should not be constantly feeling his spiritual pulse, so too the Christian community has not been given to us by God for us to be constantly taking its temperature. The more thankfully we daily receive what is given to us, the more surely and steadily will fellowship increase and grow from day to day as God pleases. I find this extraordinarily challenging because I'm so used to thinking of the idea of sanctification as being an individual personality development program, but to think of it as a community enterprise that we are called together, that we share together, and it becomes something to which we all commit. And in that commitment is our journey, and it's a, a process a process, a developing process of learning to get on. So how's it going for you with your life of community, with your life of forgiveness? Have other people hurt you? Have you hurt other people? Do you find it hard to forgive and seek reconciliation? Do you take the initiative to restore relationship or do you sit back and stew in your juices when you see a brother and sister going off track do you ignore it block it out of your mind do you shake your head i didn't think they'd make it or do you see their life of as part of yours do you do the risky thing and care enough to help See, our, our failure to pursue forgiveness and reconciliation and repentance and restoration leads to bitterness and broken relationships and conflicts within the family. So if you just stay within yourself and your own resources, that, that stays the same. It never changes and it never grows and it never bears fruit. Even that word fruit is a corporate activity. We're still suckered by the notion that we're going to get <laughs> badges for how great we've done in our individual life without understanding that the business of humanity is our business and everything comes together in that community. So if we pull back, that's almost the easy thing to do. If the goal is to foster ongoing conflict, then that's easy to do. If the goal is loving my enemies, forgiving those who wound me, offering the hope of transformation through the indwelling spirit of God, then that is a tough job, a big job. And that's what we're called to do. Lord, we pray that as offences come, we may learn to listen and watch and to seek your face, to see what you're saying to us, that you might enable us on how to respond to this right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you today. Amen.